Good morning, it's a beautiful Friday afternoon here at Delaware Tech, and I am trying to get ahead. So, we're going to be lecturing quite a bit today. Um, chapter 16 is about anemias, and it talks about the different ways that we look at our values and even our peripheral smears to help to diagnose what type of anemia a person might actually have. So there's a lot of background information that goes with this. So please bear with me, okay? You're gonna be taking a lot of notes if you're smart. Okay, so first of all, the definition of anemia, as we know, is the decreased oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. Typically, that can happen for a couple different reasons. You have a decreased amount of hemoglobin, or the hemoglobin is not functioning properly. Okay, so decreased hemoglobin efficiency, basically, or effectiveness. Okay, either because there's not enough hemoglobin or it doesn't work right. Or it can be a decreased amount in your red cells. So you lose blood volume or you lose um, the actual red cells themselves. So you, the decrease in hematocrit, if you will. All right. Um, so what does that mean to an individual? Well, uh, when, when we see a CBC come out, okay, we're going to see a decreased H and H most of the time okay we may see also that decreased red cell count all right um because if the red cells are decreased the, the hem hematocrit is going to be decreased so hemoglobin and hematocrit together are what we call an h and h okay so just so i don't start throwing terms out there and you have no clue what i'm talking about all right um <clears throat> so depending on the age and sex of the individual depends on what we see for numbers, right? The typical clinical picture of a patient that is anemic is they're tired all the time. They may have shortness of breath, okay? Um, and they just, they look pale. Um, one of the things that we do to check a patient, not us, but clinicians do to check a patient, is they'll look at their nail beds if they're white, um, or actually if they are t starting to turn blue, there's a problem. If their lips are turning blue, it's a problem. They'll pull down the lower lid on their eyes if it's extremely pale in there and not um, pink, uh, they're anemic. They'll look at their gum line. Okay. If it's white and not pink, they're anemic. So where the blood flow goes is, is pretty important. Okay. You know that it is the job of the red cells to contain the hemoglobin, which carries the oxygen. So we have decreased our red cells or we decrease our hemoglobin we decrease our oxygen out to the tissues. So when that happens, a lot of times, the body will start compensating. They'll try to compensate for, in various ways. So um, if your blood volume decreases, like you've had blood loss, uh, your heart rate will go up and your respiratory rate will go up and um, we're, your heart will start making, will start beating stronger more squeezing all that blood out faster and harder to try to get the blood to the tissues that need it. Okay. But if we have a prolonged amount of uh, anemia, like with chronic anemias and things like that, then um, what will happen is we'll, the body will start shutting, not shutting it down completely, but moving larger amounts of blood to the vital organs and not so much to your extremities and things. So that's why we get the, the bluish nail beds and, and things like that. And the feet and the hands get really cold. 
Okay. So that's part of what we have to worry about. Okay. So when we see a patient coming in and they're tired and they have shortness of breath, it could be a lot of different ways. We start looking at, um, we always run a CBC, but we also do pulmonary function tests on them because it could be something else going on. Um, so it could be congestive heart failure. It could be a, a pulmonary dysfunction. We could have a lot of things going on with that patient. Um, so CBC always helps us to get a good, a better clinical picture of what we have going on with the blood anyway. Okay. So <clears throat> when we're taking a history on a patient, we ask a whole bunch of questions and people don't understand why we ask all of these questions, but we'll, like, we'll ask them about what they've been eating. Okay. What's your diet like? What have you, been, what have you eaten in the last three days? Um, have you started any new medications? What are, what medications are you on currently? Uh, have, what do you do for a job? Or do you have exposure to certain chemicals or is there heavy metals around? Um, do you have, you know, any, where do you live? What, what do you, what do you do for a hobby? Do you, you know, go check out strip mines? I'm like, what, you know, there's a lot of different things that could happen. Um, have you, have you had what's a recent travel history and a recent travel history could be anywhere in the last year. So have you gone outside of the borders of the United States in the last year? Okay. And that's important because there are a lot of, I want to say, and this is the best way to say it, blood sucking parasites, <laughs> um, that are found in tropical and subtropical climates that we don't get here in the United States. Um, but you know, with global warming, eventually we'll get, they'll get there. Uh, they're starting, they're just starting to infringe on the lowest of our borders. They want to know, um, you know, what, what's your family history? Does anybody else in your family have any bleeding disorders? Have they had any of this? Have they had any of that? Um, have you ever had any ulcers? Have you ever had any, um, problems with bleeding or any genetic disorders that might affect the blood. And then there's this thing with called PICA. And if you have PICA, then you may um, love to chew on ice. Um, you may have a craving for cornstarch or clay or even dirt. Because what it is, is it's trying to get the iron into your system um, because you are you have issues, um, hematological issues, not um, psychobehavioral issues, okay? PICA is caused by a deficiency, a nutritional deficiency. So it's not like they're not crazy. They're just trying to get what they're supposed to have in them. So they have weird cravings. Uh, so we're going to be looking for petechia, which if you don't know what petechia is, petechia are like um, little tiny specks where a capillary has burst. So you'll see little tiny, like they don't start out as bruises. They'd start out as little red spots. Um, but then they can turn into bruises. Uh, so any bruising that we might see under the skin, they'll check, like I said, check the lower lids of the eyes. They're going to check your mouth for the gum line. They're going to check to see if you have any jaundice. So have your, do, does your skin look a little more yellow? Do your eyes look a little more yellow? Um, and they're going to do, uh, check out your heart rate and your respiratory rate and tachycardia is a high heart rate. Okay. So there are different types of anemias and whether it's moderate anemia or a severe anemia depends on whether or not it's over seven grams of hemoglobin. Okay. <clears throat> so in severe blood loss, I think I've already talked about this, but we're going to do it again. In severe blood loss, so if you've had a trauma, you've had a massive bleed, okay? Um, if you've 
cut yourself in half and st spilled a lot of blood. If you were in an accident, spilled a lot of blood. If you had a massive GI bleed, and that happens occasionally with patients, um, and they just have blood running out their their rectum, um, you will have an increased heart rate. You'll have your respiratory rate increase because you're losing the blood. That means you're decreasing your oxygen. And that's a significant event all of a sudden to happen really quickly. So then the heart starts trying to compensate by, by increasing its heart rate and increasing how hard it's contracting to try to get as much blood out to those areas as possible but then if it can't keep up that way um so you continue to lose blood it's going to move all of the blood to the areas where it needs to keep the brain the heart the lungs going okay so um so the extremities may get extremely cold they may get extremely white looking Okay. Now, if it's a slow loss of blood, so um, you have a bleeding ulcer, okay, or you have a little, um, my dad takes Coumadin, which is an anticoagulant, and if he, he, you know, occasionally it goes up way too high, and then the just the membrane in his GI tract is just not, the integrity is not great, so he ends up with these teeny little GI bleeds. So he loses a little bit of blood every single day. And what will happen is that um, he, it, over a long period of time, he starts getting that whole, I'm, I can't breathe thing going on. He has the shortness of breath. But um, what will happen is that you're going, the, the body will, increase the 2,3 BPG. You guys remember 2,3 BPG? That was back in chapter six um, through the rapapore lubering pathway. Okay. And 2,3 BPG binds to the hemoglobin to keep it in a configuration where it won't attached to the oxygen and keep the oxygen. So what it'll do is it'll, the, it'll keep unloading the oxygen to the tissues. It doesn't want the, it has a low affinity to oxygen. The oxygen doesn't want to bind to it and stay on it. It wants to offload it. Okay. Um, and we'll see an increase in erythropoietin because the, and you remember erythropoietin is called, is, produced at the kidneys so at the kidneys the cells will notice that they're not getting enough oxygen and they'll increase the erythropoietin and they'll increase the amount of red cells that are being produced so all in all um if red cell production compensates for the loss then you won't see signs of anemia really okay um which means that you the body will compensate and you won't see the shortness of breath and the and the fatigue and stuff like that my dad on the other hand also has um kidney failure from from diabetes so he does see the loss of too many red cells so he he will his hemoglobin will drop his red cells will drop it drops over a long period of time but it drops and so then he does get the shortness of breath and he does get really tired so anytime that he gets the shortness of breath and he gets really tired we go and we get an h nature or cbc done okay um it doesn't help that he also has congestive heart failure my dad's a walking uh case study for our for our um career but it's <laughs> um congestive heart failure also makes you feel shortness of breath and things like that but if you look at page 253 and you look at the box um box 16.1 it talks about how the body will respond to the severe blood loss or the slow blood loss so mechanisms 
of anemia. So basically this is why does this happen? What's, what's going on that causes anemia? Well, the, um, you know, or you better know by now that the average lifespan of a red cell is 120 days. Okay. And we lose about 1% of our red cells every day, which means that we also need to replace about 1% of our red cells every day. And the things that we need to be able to make red cells are, are pretty important. Okay. So one, some of the things that we need, we know we need iron, right? We need iron because that's in that heme portion, right? Well, if you remember correctly, that heme is stuck in the middle of a globulin chain, right? And there are four globulin chains. Well, those globulin chains are, are, are amino acids. They're proteins. So we need amino acids. We need iron. Okay. We also need B12 and folate because without the B12 and folate, particularly the B12, um, the enzymes that are necessary to produce these um, components and, or produce the hemoglobin, put it all together, make the red cells, get everything going and, and keep our metabolism where it is, ain't going to happen without vitamin B12. Okay. So vitamin B12 acts as a coenzyme, which is something that has to attach to the protein portion of the enzyme to make it able to do its work. Okay. So it's kind of like you have a car. It's perfectly capable of doing everything, but if you don't have the key to start it, it's not going anywhere. So you need the coenzyme, which is the key to get the, the enzyme moving and doing what it's supposed to be doing. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so we, if we, if you don't have the right equipment to make your red cells. It's not going to happen. Okay. If, um, the precursors that we're making are defective in some way, you know, which could be because of like genetic disorders and whatnot, um, then we're going to destroy those, right? Apoptosis. Remember the cell is scheduled for death and it just, it destroys itself before we ever get to the part where it gets, becomes a, a normal erythrocyte. Okay. Um, there are megaloblastic anemias and megaloblastic anemias are, are typically the, the pernicious anemia, the, and the folate, folic acid deficiencies. Um, Thalassemias means that there is something wrong with the hemoglobin chain and there are different types of thalassemias. Guess what? There's alpha thalassemias and there's beta thalassemias. Um, and guess what? There's an alpha one thalassemia and an alpha two thalassemia and a beta one and beta two. Do you see how this goes? Um, and then there's this sideroblastic anemia. And if you remember sideroblastic, um, sideroblasts is where like we're, we're, harboring all the iron inside the bone marrow, right? The macrophages are holding all of that in there. So that means that, well, maybe the, we don't have that going on. Maybe we don't have enough, um, iron being released to be able to be used. So sometimes it's because the erythropoiesis is not, not, not effective. Okay. Because in the ineffective one, we were, we were trying really hard, but things weren't working out so well. In this case, the erythropoiesis is not happening. It's not doing what it's supposed to. So. Again, this is the decrease in the erythroid precursors, maybe per because of the apoptosis. Okay. Um, we can see the, the thalassemias here. We can see, um, with megaloblastic anemias, um, 
that the DNA synthesis is not working properly. So it can, it can cause deficiencies or it can cause, um, inefficient or, or sorry, insufficient, um, erythropoiesis. Okay. So we have some case, in some cases it can be an, an autoimmune thing. Like sometimes it's, we don't get, we don't have enough iron. Sometimes we aren't making enough erythropoietin. So like those people that have, um, renal failure. <clears throat> so the, there's a lot of different things. One of the things that people don't understand is if you have an infection, okay, if you have a chronic infection or you have a long-term infection, something that, that will happen is that the, the infective organism will take the iron. They, they hoard the iron um, for themselves to use, which then sometimes causes a deficiency of iron in the patient because they don't have the, the iron store available to them. Okay. Um, sometimes the, the insufficient erythropoiesis is because remember that hypocellularity of the bone marrow. Um, sometimes it's not so much hypocellularity, but maybe it's taken up by a whole bunch of other things. So one of them, if true hypocellularity, we've got a lot of fibers in there. Okay. Um, so we're getting that fibrosis, um, or perhaps it's overtaken with a bunch of white cell precursors because we have a leukemic, um, bone marrow. So we've got leukemia going on and we've got a whole bunch of the white cell precursors in there and not enough erythroid uh, precursors, or there could just be tumors in there. So you can have osteosarcoma and it's taking up the area in the bone marrow. And then we don't have the ability to, to do what needs to be done for erythropoiesis. We've talked about the acute blood loss. Um, we've talked about what can happen here. I talked about having a trauma where you were in an accident, you had a major cut, you were bled a, a bunch, or if you have a GI loss for a GI bleed, so you have a major rupture happening and, and you're just pouring blood out of the, the rectum. Um, increased red cell hemolysis can be intrinsic, in that like, okay, you have, um, the red cell membrane has, has gotten an issue. Okay. So remember when they get, when the red cells get senescent, um, the, the membranes get less elastic. Well, if that all happens at one time, then we're going to lose a bunch of red cells at once. Right. Um, or perhaps sometimes people have to have their spleen removed. And once their spleen is removed, then they, uh, I know this sounds really strange, but then they can get that hereditary spherocytosis. And then the spherocytes, as you well know, um, don't have the nice pliable membranes and they tend to get destroyed a lot easier. So it could be a red cell thing. It could be enzymes not working properly. Um, could be something wrong with the, the hemoglobin that's causing the hemolysis. Um, extrinsic factors could be uh, an immune thing. So it could be some antibody mediated process or um, extrinsic could also mean, now intrinsic means intrinsic to the cells. Extrinsic means outside of the cells. So it doesn't mean outside of the body. Okay. Extrinsic in this case could be you put in a mechanical heart valve, a metal one, and it shears the red cells as it's closing. Okay. So there could be an edge on there that, that's just not good. Or it could be an infection, an infection that's causing destruction. So some of the things like malaria, Okay. If you have an infection with a malarial pa parasite, some plasmodium species, um, they can cause the cells to rupture and we end up with hemolytic anemias a lot of times from malaria. 
okay? And then, of course, that chronic blood loss is really slow blood loss, and typically we don't see a good presentation that strikes us as, man, this person's anemic, because their body typically learns how to compensate, uh, and we don't see it as easily. So what do we do? What are we looking at when we're trying to diagnose anemia? Well, first and foremost, we're going to look at the CBC and we're going to look at the red cell indices, right? You guys know that you have a white count and you have a red count. Well, if the red count's low, okay, next thing you're going to be looking at is the hemoglobin and the hematocrit. If you don't do that, then there's something wrong because if the, he if the red cell count is low, the hematocrit should be low, right? Okay. Um, so, and the hemoglobin content is very important. So is it because we lost a lot of red cells or is the hemoglobin actually not there in the cells? So we want to look at the red cells, the number of red cells that we have. We want to look at the hemoglobin. We want to look at the hematocrit. Um, if you remember correctly, um, the MCHC is the mean cell hemoglobin concentration, which relies on how many red cells we have, how big they are, how much hemoglobin there is, right? If you remember all this stuff, okay? Um, so we're going to talk about each of these things. What the, we're going to look at the red cell histogram, what the RDW means. We're going to be looking at a bunch of stuff to be able to try to help diagnose what type of anemia this really is. Okay, so first things first, for your red cell indices, what's MCV? MCV is mean corpuscular volume or mean cell volume, which is the average volume, AKA size of your erythrocyte, right? Okay, how much fits in that thing? So you look at your hematocrit, you get your hematocrit, you get your red cell, con red cell count. Okay, so you take the hematocrit value, which is all of those pack cells, right? All of those red cells down there. And then you basically take time, times that by 10, divided by how many red cells we actually have, right? So you have the volume of all of the red cells in that hematocrit. And then you divide it by how many red cells we actually counted and we get the volume of the red cells. Does, I hope that makes sense to you, okay? If you guys do not know, and I think I mentioned this way long time ago, a femtoliter is the measurements that we use in the uh, small, little teeny tiny amount of liquid that we measure when we're using red cells. Um, and a femtoliter is 10 to the negative 15 liters okay so you guys know a milliliter is 10 to the negative 3 right a microliter is 10 to the negative 6 a nanoliter is 10 to the negative 9 right femtoliter 10 to the negative 15 we got still have a ways to go so it's um it's a really really teeny tiny amount right so red cells teeny little things okay normal range 80 to 100, okay, so they say 96, 80 to 100, okay, MCH, mean cell hemoglobin, okay, so now we take, this is how much hemoglobin we measured, and we divide it by the amount of red cells, so that we get how much hemoglobin is in each cell. I mean, this is really not hard stuff. You have to understand mean is the average, and we're looking for the cell. So if we go for the mean cell volume, we want to know, okay, so the total volume of red cells to begin with was our hematocrit, okay, because we learned that when we did the microhematocrits in the lab. So total amount of red cells packed down after centrifugation, that's what hematocrit is, right? Then you divide it by the red cells, and you get your mean cell volume makes sense right and you got to just remember that you got those multiplied times 10 all right and then the mean cell hemoglobin is how much hemoglobin we have total divided by how many red cells we have and we get our mean cell hemoglobin okay so you have to actually pay attention to its mean it's the average 
cell hemoglobin. And we're talking about red cells. The average hemoglobin in a red cell. So if we take all of the hemoglobin and we divide it by all of the red cells, we're going to get how much? It makes sense. I'm sorry, but it really does make sense. And yes, when I was sitting in your spot, I was going, I can't keep these things straight. MCV, MCH, MCHC, MC what, MC who. Uh, it makes no sense. But then after a while, I'm like, oh, wait. Yeah, that does make sense. That was well after I passed my registry. Did it start making sense? But it made sense. <laughs> It was when I actually had to start teaching on the bench as a tech to pe to students coming in. And then it was like, you just break it down. See, it's mean. That's the average. The average cell hemoglobin. So you need to know all this hemoglobin divided by the cells. And you have the average hemoglobin per cell. And they were like, oh, average hemoglobin per cell. Got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it's, and I know. You guys are like, yeah, it still doesn't make any sense. It's okay, though. Um, normal range, 27 to 32. Okay. And I'll tell you, MCHC is 32 to 36. If you don't know anything else, know your MCV value and know your MCHC value. Okay. Because MCV and MCHC are extremely important. You're also going to know your RDWs. Um, but the mean cell hemoglobin concentration so <clears throat> hemoglobin all the hemoglobin that we measure right the amount of hemoglobin that we had okay this one gets multiplied by a hundred this is the weird one this one gets multiplied by a hundred okay and then we divide it by the hematocrit okay so remember that the MCH, we just want to know how much hemoglobin was per red cell, right? Okay. In this one, we want to know how heavy or how much it weighs, how much of that hemoglobin is actually there due to the volume of the red cell. So this one, the volume of the red cell can be different, right? It can be different in, in, you may have a dimorphic population. Some of them are small and some of them are big, right? So what we're looking at is the average amount of hemoglobin based on the volume of the red cell. So to get the volume, the total volume of red cells, we need that hematocrit value. So this one is the hemoglobin times 100 and divided by the hematocrit, not the red cells. Because we're not doing it per cell. We're taking it, taking it as the average amount of cells. All of the cells together, how much volume it is, how much hemoglobin by weight to volume. Okay. MCHC value, 32 to 36, extremely important to know, okay? Highlight it, circle it, put a, make a, a note card, MCHC, hemoglobin per hematocrit, 32 to 36. You'll get it. Trust me. Okay. So, red cell histograms, okay, are... The red cell histogram typically helps us to see what the red cell distribution width is. What the heck does that mean? Um, we talked about this once before. And this basically shows us the difference in sizes of our red cells. Most people have a very skinny bell-shaped curve. It looks like a giant hill. Okay. Um, because they don't have a whole lot of variation in sizes of the red cells. Okay. A normal person, healthy person, doesn't have a whole lot of um, nutritional deficiencies, have no infections, no nothing. We're like they, they make one population of cells. They keep regenerating and losing at a constant rate. They're all staying about the same size. Okay. So... 
when that hill gets shorter and wider, it means we have a whole lot more size variation because you have a whole lot of small ones on the left, you have a whole lot of top big ones on the right, right? And, and it just shows a big difference, okay? Um, see this right here? That, that, that's just way too many words. How many people read this? Because, like, it, it, that just drives me absolutely crazy. Um, but it's, what you do need to see is heterogeneous means that there's more than one population, okay? But homogeneous or homogeneous um, means that they pretty much all look the same, okay? So some people, what they do before they do anything else is they're going to look at their red cells, then they look at their RDW. Okay, because they look at how many red cells do we have. Okay, that's normal. What's the RDW? Oh, yep, that population is pretty normal too. So they are going to see that there's not a whole lot of anisocytosis. There's not a whole lot of different populations. It, it helps us to see um, the population without actually looking at the slide. I know it sounds weird, but it basically shows, uh, you know, the volumes. So this is, um, this is actually a, a kind of wide histogram. Um, but what I, what we normally like to see is we normally like to see something that goes up and comes down and it comes down pretty quickly. This is a pretty, it's, this is actually a little wide. Um, but sometimes we see things like this okay now you guys know retics are a little bit bigger than your normal mature red cells right so this is something that you'll see um you'll see your normal population and then you're going to be like oh wait and then we have some bigger ones so sometimes you see a a dimorphic population so you have larger cells and you have smaller cells um, in there so and then this guy here if there's only this little tiny bump that's okay you know why because that typically says oh yeah two of them went through at the same time okay not not a huge thing that's not bad at all your normal RDW is like 12 to 16 right and not what it was I think that's what it was but let me go back And I have to go back a lot. Uh, 12 to 15. Okay. So we're good. That one was 14.8. So we're good. Right. This, not so much. This is out of the normal range. And we see two different populations. We're definitely going to have to look at this slide. Because we need to know what the heck is going on. So when we see a bunch of polychromasia. Right. We're going to be like, oh, it's a bunch of retics coming out there. So why would retics, why would we have a higher amount of retics? Why would we have a bunch of that going on? We need to have increased red cell production for some reason, right? Retic counts. All right. So with retic counts, um, you might look and and see what is going on okay retics will help us to um see how much production is happening in the bone marrow okay so a retic count gives you the road boat the red cell production in the bone marrow they've if they've just left the bone marrow, they're going to contain that residual RNA, which is going to stain blue on that um, new methylene blue, right? And the, you're not going to be able to see the actual RNA on the right stain. You can only use, you see it on that retic stain. So that new methylene blue is going to be what you're going to, to have, right? Um, <clears throat> 
the new methylen blue stains the RNA. Okay, shows a reticula in the in the cell, not just like a, a one single spot, more than that. Okay. Um, and these can stay in the in the peripheral blood for one to two days and then they mature they lose that residual rna it, it degrades um and they become your mature red cell okay um <clears throat> so a normal person has a retic anywhere from 0.5 to 2.5 okay i like that whole one to two is good right um newborns look at that they have to make a whole lot more because they're growing rapidly right uh so 1.5 to 6 percent so they have to keep up their blood production right um to do a corrective retic count you're gonna base it on hem her hematocrit okay um you take the the hematocrit of the individual and then you find the normal hematocrit based on the age and sex that is in the front of your book in the front of your book and then you do that whole thing um times whatever retick you already got retick count that you got um take your percentage multiply it times your the normal hematocrit and then um you take the the patient's hematocrit value and divide it by whatever you had gotten from doing this math and we'll get um a corrected retic count now sometimes um if we have those stress retics and the stress retics actually stay in the blood longer because they were released earlier remember they if you have an excessive amount of blood loss and we need to get red cells out there really quickly those stress retics will be thrown out there even faster and they stay in the blood longer so that's going to affect your actual retic count and that corrected retic count won't really be right either okay so it's it's just interesting so the that's going to cause that to happen am i going to ask you to do an rpi no you know why because the instruments do your rpis for you why do you need to know that because like how long are you do you really know how long those retics are out there no you don't so no not gonna do it okay but absolute counts you take your red cell count times the percent retic to get how many you actually have all right um so how many we how much per what percent of the red cells are actually reticulocytes that's that's what we're looking for so the re reticula the reticulocyte count the absolute reticulocyte count should for a an average adult should fall between 25 and 75 um for that newborn it should be much higher it should be around 90. okay um the immature reticulocyte fraction um, we might use this after we have treatment to find out if the bone marrow is actually responding. So like if you give epigen, um, or erythropoietin to a patient, we want to see if it's actually working so we can be looking for this IRF value. All right. So hang on. I have to pause for a minute. Okay, we also do the peripheral blood smears, and the blood smears, then when we stain them, we're going to basically be looking at the hemoglobin, the hematocrit, our MCHC, our RDW, our MCV. Do things look normal? Do, does this look like a normal size cell? Does it look like it's got enough hemoglobin in there per the size of the cell? If you look at pages um, 255 and 256, it actually talks about all the different morphological changes and what kind of disease state we can um, associate with it so we're gonna we're gonna see like all of these different anemias and things that you're gonna see these things showing up in there and so we're like oh okay well that makes sense yeah um 
So we see lots and lots of uh, big oval red cells. Could be, it's a megaloblastic anemia. Mega cell. Megaloblastic anemia. It's big. So it was while it was making it, it became a large cell. Okay, so that's the blasto part, megaloblastic. So while it's making it, it had become a large cell. We'll explain that more in chapter 17. Okay, but these two tables talk a lot about the different inclusions in red cell morphology and what it can, how it correlates with different um, anemias and, and thalassemias and things like that. So it, take a look at it, okay? Um, as I talk more about what we're seeing later, you're going to, I'm going to talk more about what morphological changes we'll also see. All right. So it's, I don't expect you to get all that down right now. We're going to talk about it as we go. Okay. Um, in the white cells, of course, we're going to do differential. Are the white cells normal morphology? Do they look normal or are they abnormal? Um, platelets, of course, we're going to do a platelet estimate again. Do they look morphologically normal? Are they large? Are they small? Do they exhibit satellitosis? Um, these are things that we're, we're going for here. Uh, so the red cell morphology, here are some of the examples. Again, those tables, 16.2 and 16.3 on pages 255 and 256. This is helpful. That's on page 257, by the way, in the bigger form. So you can actually see what these things are. Um, remember, burr cells have little rounded edges to them. Okay, that appear evenly around the cell. Acanthocytes would, are more spicules, um, and they are not in a normal distribution around the cell. Okay. If you haven't listened to my red cell morphology lecture yet, you need to, because that is a very, very important part of knowing what's going on with our red cells. You have to be able to differentiate the different um, types of red cells and, and what they could possibly mean. Why do they form in the first place? That's a big thing. Okay. <clears throat> so sometimes um, we have to do bone marrows um, because we haven't figured out what exactly is going on and with the bone marrow it can help us to explain where this anemia came from so if you look at the bone marrow after you've looked at everything else and you go in and you look at the bone marrow and you find out there's a whole bunch of fibers in there um the hypocellularity and you're like, oh, well, no wonder. They're probably not making a whole lot of anything else either because we've we've got myelofibrosis in here. Um, it might, you might see megaloblastic erythroid precursors so that they're, they're large, okay? Um, you might see a lack of iron stores. So then you're like, oh, IDA, iron deficiency anemia. So th that may be the last piece that you need is looking at that bone marrow to help to identify the actual anemia for the patient. Now, there's a whole lot of other things that we would try and do first most of the time, okay? Um, so I know you're gonna laugh at me. You're gonna be like, what do you mean? You're, we do your analysis um, because you do not understand how much information you get out of your analysis yet. So you don't have any idea um, why we would be doing your analysis. But one of the things that we do is we're going to look for hemolysis. We're going to look for red cell loss. We're going to look for um, an increased bilirubin or urobilinogen, okay, which hopefully will correlate with some of our serum levels as well. Um, so that unconjugated bilirubin that we might look for in our serum would indicate that there is intravascular hemolysis going on. So something is hemolyzing the stuff before it gets to 
the spleen and the macrophages and, and what, you know, the things that we're trying to do. So it's outside of, it's, it's some sort of intrinsic, extrinsic factor, not an intrinsic factor. Um, we're going to look at our renal tests and why are we looking at our renal tests? We need to know if we have renal function that's normal. If it's not normal, then we're not going to have um, the right amount of erythropoietin being produced. Um, liver function tests so that we would have the right amount of cholesterols and, and phospholipids and things that we need for the red cell membranes. Okay, do you, uh, do you see how complex this gets now? This is crazy busy, important stuff that you are learning. Okay, huge picture. You have to look at the huge picture, not just what's right in front of you. Because if you just look at what's right in front of you, you are going to miss the whole story. Okay, if you are one per, if you are the kind of person who always focuses on the trees instead of the forest, this field may not be for you. Um, I had a, a woman a few years ago and she said, my husband is always telling me I can't see the forest for the trees. And I said, well, you're going to have to start, um, trying to do like those searches where you spot the differences in the two different panels to be able to find all the differences and things like that. I said, to see if you're actually, if you, instead of looking at very specific things, look at it as the scene and try to find the differences. She said, I am terrible at those things. I said, well, guess what? That means your mind cannot handle all of that information at once. I said, and I'm not sure you're going to do really well. And guess what? She failed out of her next to last semester. So she was getting ready to go to ro clinical rotations. Um, she never came back. She's like, yep, not for me. I can't, I, my brain does not work that way. So we're telling you early, if your brain does not work that way, you either need to train it to work that way, or it may never work that way. And you may not do very well at, in this career. Okay. So iron studies, we look at the iron level. We look at the ferritin. We look at, um, haptoglobin. We look at, uh, transferrin. Okay. We look at all of that. Might need to have B12 and folate levels to make sure to see what's going on. It, it, is that the cause? Is we have pernicious anemia? Do we have what, what's causing this megaloblastic anemia? Okay. So if we're suspecting iron deficiency anemia, typically we're going to see a low cell volume and we're going to see a low RPI, which means that we're not making the re the retics. We're not making the red cells and they're really small cells because typically the iron's not there. That's what iron deficiency is. So we're also going to look at the serum iron, serum iron binding capacity, the percent saturation on the transferrin, and we're going to look at ferritin stores where we store our iron. Okay. So you, we have different, different protocols that we have depending on what it is that we're looking for. So the very first thing that we're looking at when we're trying to diagnose a, a anemias is we're going to look at that CBC. So you're going to look at the red count. You're going to look at the H and H, the hemoglobin and the hematocrit, and you're going to look at the MCV. What's the volume of these cells? Okay. And once we have that, then we can, um, <clears throat> start looking at how, look, I already got that far and I didn't even realize it. We can start going and, and, and putting it into classifications. Is it a, is it a microcytic anemia? Is it a macrocytic? Is it a normocytic anemia? Right? Um, and if you look at page 259, figure 16.2, it says, Hey, if it's a microcytic anemia, it could be sideroblastic. It could be iron deficiency. It could be because we have a chronic infection and, we're, and they're hoarding the iron. It could be a thalassemia or a hemoglobin E. Okay, so those are all microcytic. Macrocytic, there's a whole lots of them. There's, it, if you can have megaloblastic, which would be B12 or folate deficiency, could be myelodysplasia. Um, 
it could be caused by some medications or drugs. Uh, if it's non-megaloblastic, what does that mean? It means that it wasn't produced large, okay? It, it's large, but it's not because of the way it was pro being produced. This is typically um, chronic liver disease because of the red cell membrane thing going on. Alcoholism, alcohol also affects the liver, just so you know. Um, and aplastic anemia, meaning that we're not making too many cells, so the ones that we're making are actually pretty large. Then there can be normocytic um, anemias. And when we're looking at normocytic anemias, the first thing that we're looking at after the MCV is we're looking at the retic count. Okay, because they're normal size cells. So then we go, okay, well, wait a minute. Is that a production thing or not? Okay, so that's where we run into to where we're going with this. Okay, um, <clears throat> so. If you do not know, and if you have never ever heard of this before, iron deficiency anemia is the most common microcytic anemia that there is. And typically they are also hypochromic. So it's a microcytic hypochromic anemia. They have abnormal iron studies. Okay, so I'd be putting that somewhere up here. Iron deficiency anemia number one. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm hoping you understand this. Um, the megaloblastics is almost always B12 or folate deficiency. It's one or the other. Okay, um, <clears throat> so we have to then figure out, well, is it that or is it something else going on? All right. Um, and for the normocytic, to get a normal mean cell volume, interestingly enough, you could actually have a dimorphic population. So you're going to have to look at the, at the red cell morphology on your smear to find out if you have small cells and large cells that even out average into a normal MCV. Okay, so there's there's a lot of stuff that goes into all of this, but you know, I, I'm I'm trying to teach you a little at a time. Okay, all right. So this here's your microcytics. Here's your macrocytics. Here's the normocytics. Right. This is what you had to look at next. To what's the retic value? Is it normal or is it decreased? If it's normal or decreased, then it may be one of these. If it's increased, it could be one of the, one of these many things down here. Look, there's like all this stuff down here. So um, if you guys remember microangiopathic means that your vessels are really small and the, the red cells are shearing as they grow through. And then there's macroangiopathic. What the heck is that? So because it's too big, then they start bump, bumping into each other and squeezing, trying to squeeze through and then they get stuck. Um, Infectious agents, so those pathogens, drugs, there's chemicals, venom. So certain venoms cause hemolytic hem hemolysis and it causes you to, to lose all of your blood. Um, it lyses the red cells. So certain snakes and spiders and stuff. Um, extensive burns can cause a loss of some sort. All right, so then we have this next one, and this next one talks about, okay, so first we're going to look at the retic count, um, and then we're going to decide what's going on. So if a retic count is high, then typically it's due to we, we're losing red cells somehow. So is it just a hemorrhage, or do we have something else going on? Is, are they being hemolyzed? So did we have an acute blood loss? right? That would be this guy. Or are our cells being destroyed? If the retic count is normal or even low, then we need to look at that MCV value to figure out what our choices might be. Okay. So I kind of like this one. It's a little less busy to the eye. <laughs> Um, the other one wouldn't be so bad if it was laid out a little bit better. 
but I hate the fact that like there's this that goes down here and then there's this that goes down here just make it a lot longer of a page and and reorganize it a little sorry um so there's there's basically the two different approaches um of trying to classify anemias and in these classifications um, we we can look at the RDW okay if the RDW is normal um, then you know we're we've got a pretty nice regular normal population of cells so then we have to figure out okay so they're they're not all over the place we don't have a lot of production versus non-production what what's actually going on so we have to move on from there um, the heterogeneous means that we have an elevated RDW so the sizes of our cells are all over the place and then we got to figure out why that is happening so if you look at page 261 um, it shows you potential things that are happening with the RDW so the, if you see your RDW, the next thing you want to be looking at is your mean cell volume to go with that. Okay. For this, we're using the, the retic count. Okay. And we need to know if it's decreased red cell production or increased or normal red cell production. Then we've got to figure out is it and is it something that happened with the actual red cells themselves or is it something like with development and, and structure wise or is it something that's happening to the red cells from outside of the cells or is it just a blood loss thing okay stuff that i just said two minutes ago later i'm going through it again different slide no pretty blue boxes same stuff okay so chapter review these are some of the things that you should be able to explain okay uh trust me we will learn more as we go this next test is on chapters 16 17 18 19 not sure if 20 is in there or not i think it's just 16 17 18 and 19. so you're going to have four chapters on this next test there's a lot of information this was just an intro to anemia is basically what do we have to look at what are some of the values that are important you need your mch you need your mchc you need to know what mcv is how to figure them out right you have to those are important okay what does rdw mean what's it for what's it rpi these are important okay the next step is chapter 17 starts talking about the actual anemias okay based on all the stuff that we need to make the red cells so it's a, a red cell production piece so the iron the b12s the folates what's going on with all this stuff how do we make the hemoglobin how do we make the heme how do we do it right this is the iron kinetics and heme metabolism piece of it we've already learned about the iron and the iron storage and all that stuff if you can't remember all that it might be helpful to go back to those um proteins what do the what does each protein do what does haptoglobin do what does he hemopexin do what does ferritin do what does transferrin do okay um and then we're going to talk about the heme metabolism and how it comes to be and what we do with it okay so how it's produced how it's broken down um pretty sure it talks about how it broke down but it's it's not a terribly long chapter but it does have a lot of things a lot of information okay and it starts introducing us to the different types of anemias so what's pernicious anemia how how what's megal what are the megaloblastic anemias how do they come to to fruition um why why does ida make small cells and, and b12 folate deficiency make big cells that's in the next chapter okay so on onward and upward